Hi there. This is a pre-Chapter 15 primer for those of you who follow the Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition role-playing tabletop game I play every Saturday. One I upload as an audio file to YouTube and one Jordan broadcast live. The Coterie has had a week of downtime between sessions where they've done their own thing, as detailed to me the storyteller, but the Concrete Jungle never sleeps and activity has taken place without them. Rather than open the session with a massive info dump, I gave them the results of everything last night. You know, what they knew had happened through contacts, observations, and so forth. However, that doesn't help any of you. So in this short video, I'll be sharing that information with you too, so you know what's happening going into today's session. You may download it through a Mediafire link in the video description, and I'll be reading it aloud here. Now, you'll recall that last session ended on early morning, Monday, March 23rd, 1998. While Byron and Joseph were studying, and while Marcus was witnessing the events of Elysium, David was securing last resort escape routes for the other members of the Coterie, just in case. We've already hand-waved him telling the other members of the Coterie about what he had done later that night. In addition, it becomes public knowledge that Boss Callahan and 100% of the Anarch movement in Staten Island supports Marlena, as the next Prince of New York City. You'll recall her as the Dark Horse Brugia candidate, whom no one really regarded seriously. The kindred of the city gossip endlessly. There is, of course, the final death of Helen Panhard, the Vintru, uh, child of Prince Michaela, one of the former princes of New York City, who was most responsible for attracting Camarilla attention here. While Calibro served briefly as a wartime prince, Prince Michaela was the entrepreneur who really got the Camarilla's foot in the door in Manhattan. Uh, who did it? Was it for the princedom, or were there other circumstances? There's also the ramifications of what the Anarchs did last night when they marched into Elysium and staked Sheriff Kadir al -Asmai. Granted, the sheriff evidently lost control of himself after being accused of consorting with a Zamitsi fiend to manipulate the entire city. But can the rest of kindred society allow the Anarchs to come and go as they please? Boss Callahan has apparently mobilized them into a unified force, and the concept of unified Anarchs is enough to make even the vampiric mind real. How did Marlena win the support of the Anarchs, and what will the Anarchs do going forward to champion Marlena in the future? Naturally, there's also heated discussion concerning, concerning Sevalod Cerveni, a Zamitsi Autarchus living beneath the city? In Central Park, no less, and he's apparently been there for hundreds of years? What had once been obscure knowledge has now become open fact among all the neonates of the city. Why didn't the Camarilla deal with him? Where have the Tremere been in all of this? And what are Sevalod's true intentions lurking within a mansion far underground? Speaking of the Tremere, apparently zero of them came along to hear Kadir's coronation speech. Are all of them fully behind Eugenio Estevez as the next Prince of New York? Did they know about Kadir's traitorous allegiance? Do they have plans of their own, those shifty warlocks? With, the, with both the primary Ventru and Toreador candidates out of the picture, it would seem that Genie's got a straight shot for the princedom. But the Dark Horse Marlena has made a dramatic appearance on the political scene, and she can no longer be discounted. Also, a heat wave strikes the northeastern United States. Temperatures rise as high as 89 degrees Fahrenheit in the Big Apple, surpassing the previous March record by 3 degrees. And the 1998 Academy Awards are held tonight, with the Best Picture Oscar being awarded to Jim Klein's White Star, a movie centered around the luxury passenger liner of the same name that sunk horrifically in 1912. The movie received a total of 14 nominations, winning 11 awards in the process. Now, on Tuesday, March 24, 1998, a new topic has emerged. What will become of the still-staked Sheriff Kadir al-Asmai? Certainly Kadir has few supporters left in the city now, as public opinion has shifted significantly against this once-respected Toreador. There's no telling how much of Boss Callahan's story was true, but the fact that Uncle Smelly and the Nosferatu aligned with him gives serious credit to the accusation, as does Kadir losing his goddamn mind. For the time being, there is currently no sheriff in the city, nor is there a keeper of Elysium, and the Elysium security force is milling about like an ant missing its head. In this massive power vacuum, there has clearly been jockeying for position, but the Tremere have once again presented a unified and silent front of the matter, an ominous silence on the horizon before the coming of the storm. 
Regardless of what the gossip might be on the street, there is one opinion that's shared. Calibros is a worthless snake. The cowardly Nosferatu abdicated the princedom without a clear successor, while the Camarilla still needed him to present a unified front against the Sabbat. Because he abandoned the domain for his own selfish goals, the past two months of strife and bloodshed rest on his shoulders. He has consequently alienated both the city and perhaps his clan as well. After all, Gerard Rafin also known as Uncle Smelly to non Nosferatu, might be somewhat of a political activist, but Celebros is still very much the recognized face of the sewer rats in New York City. Excuse me. Certainly the other Nosferatu will not appreciate their association with the sinking ship. Now, the abnormal heat wave heat wave persists in New York City, and a severe thunderstorm combined with intense winds do not alleviate the situation. Some attribute this to global warming, others to the gods, but really Earth is a mercurial place, and who's to say what freak weather it's been capable of all these years? Now, there is a massacre at a middle school in Arkansas. Two students, aged 11 and 13, fired upon both teachers and fellow students. Five dead, ten wounded. The public backlash is immense, and it focuses on both gun control as well as video game violence. On Wednesday, March 25, 1998, news of the absurd kindred shenanigans in New York City has spread across the entire eastern seaboard of the United States and beyond. At the behest of Justicar Jaroslav Pasek, <coughs> excuse me, that's the, that's the cereal I ate for this morning for breakfast. Theo Bell has returned to the concrete jungle, and he's not leaving any time soon. See, the Archon wasn't in a good mood to begin with, having to return here to babysit some idiots. And to complicate matters, Kadir, whose body has been left staked all this time, has apparently vanished from Elysium. The security force doesn't know where he went. Kadir's former deputies don't know where he went. The Tremere are the natural suspects. Only High Regent Iceling Sturbridge claims zero involvement in the situation. Perhaps the warlocks snuck him into one of their chantries to experiment on him, see if they could discern whether he was truly connected to the Zamitsi fiend, and if so, whether they could gain anything from it. Maybe he's even been shipped off to Vienna, but nope, no confession. So an angry Theo Bell, one of the most respected and feared kindred in the entire United States, much less the eastern coast, gets the word out through various meetings and one terse ter speech in each Elysium. Until the Big Apple gets its shit together, Theo Bell is here to stay. Theo, in his first act of overbearing, highly respected, you do not piss me off power, has named Valentine the new keeper of Elysium. The Ventru Rake has accepted the position graciously, although the appointment may bring its own drama. Valentine has done a superb job of keeping neutral thus far in the race for the princedom, but he now has even greater influence, and the remaining candidates are undeniably interested in his support. Well, with Marlena looking to organize regular and massive kindred events in Madison Square Garden, how will Valentine handle the situation? The turbulent weather results resulted rather in not one but two tornadoes touching down in the New York City metropolitan area within 12 hours of each other. At least a dozen have been killed by Mother Nature, with many more injured and damaged, estimating in the hundreds of millions. Emergency services are overloaded, and the streets become even more crowded. The heat wave has not subsided, leaving meteorologists and weather pundits baffled. Public opinion against United States President Cliff Benton is divided. Many American citizens don't care about what alleged sexual indiscretions the charismatic man had in office. What they care about more is that their president is lying about it, repeatedly, even in front of a federal grand jury, especially when the facts, as presented, look almost conclusively like Benton engaged in extramarital activities. Consequently, the normally deadlocked Congress has gotten its shit together, and the House of Representatives has impeached the President on charges of perjury and obstruction of justice. The trial is set to begin in May, and it will be interesting to see what comes of it. Now, on Thursday, March 26, in spite of the extreme weather conditions dealing damage to the city, and in contrast to what may be Valentine's political views, Marlena organizes a gathering of kindred at Madison Square Garden. 
Despite the outspoken Brugia's popularity with the Anarchs, the only one to show up from that faction is Duke Wiley. Perhaps the presence of Theobell is intimidating enough to frighten off even dozens of armed and armored Anarchs. That's not to say the event received no attention. Many of the kindred in the city attend, from newly arrived neonates to prominent elders. The primary clan in attendance is Brugia, but observers from all the Camarilla clans are there to hear what Marlena has to say. Marlena is not the most well-spoken individual. She can be quite coarse and blunt at times, but she is incredibly charismatic and genuinely motivated. The Camarilla fought long and hard to claim this city from the Sabbat, and they've marked their territory. Those devils will no longer be a threat. It's time for peace, and not from an overbearing conservative who will manipulate the kindred of the city to befit his whim. The princedom is not a monarchy, and it's not a tyranny. Rather, it's a democratic position held in trust for the vampires of the city to help them and to watch over them in their time of need. Eugene and Carter would keep the Anarchs consigned to Staten Island, or worse, would sever all ties to the Gangrel, would kick the Nosferatu back down to the sewers, would propagate the skewed balance of power. We're in this unlife together, she cries, and we don't have to like each other, we don't have to speak to each other, but there's over twenty million kind in the city, over such a vast area. How fat are we that we must gorge ourselves upon so much without sharing the bounty? There's enough territory to go around, and then some. Many neonates, particularly those who aren't politically inclined, seem swayed by Marlena's words. The Brugia, naturally, are going to support their own, but there are definitely supporters among the Malkavians, Nosferatu, and even the Toreador. Naturally, the Gangrel are moot on the situation, but a prince who tolerates them and recognizes the domains that Calibros gifted them wouldn't be so bad. She might be rough around the edges, but damn it, she's not a batshit Malk or a lying warlock. Now, the weather isn't getting any better. While the temperatures do plummet significantly to fit in with normal March temperatures, the dark sky is covered on a carpet of clouds. Shortly after midnight, a lengthy series of mighty lightning bolts strike in the New York City metropolitan area, 144 in total, generating both na national and even international interest. Experts are flummoxed as to how these incidents are appearing with little warning, how violent these incidents are, and how they seem to be gravitating around this area of the world. Granted, there have been other violent storms that have struck, including a wrathful tornado in the Middle East just a few days ago, but this, this just seems weird, and human science is having some difficulty explaining it. Now, on Friday, March 27th, Match simultaneously calls the entire coterie, and in a group conversation gives them the following, Hey, long time no chat. I was beginning to worry you'd been dusted, but then I remembered I gave you what you needed, so you must be just fine. Awkward pause. Listen, I understand this call is out of the blue, and that I'm not your one and only contact, but you've all been good associates, and I wanted you all to know that Match cares about his associates. Besides, I feel a little bad at your time when you made it poorly, so this one's on the house. Ominous pause. I have a friend who has a friend who tells me the Camarilla are planning something big, that Theo's not just here to babysit us. That cat leaving, living beneath the city has some bad vibes coming his way. At the freak weather is Tremere's will or some bullshit. Hell, if I understand the warlocks, I kick up the feet, lay low for a spell, see what them fools get up to. To provide further incentive to everyone staying indoors, a blizzard begins earlier in the day, somewhere around noon a short time after the final lightning bolt struck. Temperatures have bottomed out at zero degrees Fahrenheit, a change of 89 degrees within the past 24 hours. A heavy blanket of snow has fallen on not just New England this time, but the entire eastern seaboard, inhibiting overland travel and eliminating airplane flights. However, for all the noteworthiness this would normally be to the news, yet another instance of abnormal weather in less than a week, no news outlet gives more than casual interest towards the current situation, as if they've all been silenced in one fashion or another. As Kindred control most of the news in the city, it would come as no surprise to any of the player characters, but it would certainly be intriguing. Now, on Saturday, March 28, 1998, the blizzard stops in the mid-morning, shortly after sunrise, and its effect has been nothing short of show-stopping. Four feet 
of snow have been dropped on the New York City metropolitan area. Already strained emergency services from the rain, the heat wave, the tornadoes, and the flurry of lightning bolts become even more burdened with the task of attempting to clear the numerous arteries of the city. Tons of snow are tossed into the Atlantic. For a second day, there are no airplane flights to the area, although supply trucks and all other manners of vehicles from across the state and even nationally are arriving piecemeal to assist those who've lost power, lost shelter, lost friends and family, but the vast scope of the event leaves far too much territory to cover for underfunded agencies. It will take at least a week before the city becomes fully functional again. In addition, former Prince Calabros officially gives his full and total support to Carter Vanderweyden, citing the Malkavian's commitment to the traditions, along with his clear desire to unite the kindred of the city for greater prosperity. While Calabros doesn't have much political juice left, the support still comes from a recognizable cabaret elder, and it's noteworthy particularly because, in short order, Catherine Weiss and Harpy Thomas Arturo also give their public support to Vanderweyden. Artur Arturo holds considerable pull among the social kindred, and Weiss is a highly respected, albeit still fairly unknown, member of the Camarilla. These shifts in political allegiance will likely cause a string of dominoes to fall behind the Malkavian, and they might be the genesis of a serious bid for power. Now, on Sunday, March 29th, the battle lines are being more clearly defined as the fight for the princedom turns into a legitimate contest between three individuals. The keeper of Elysium himself, Valentine, has broken silence on the issue by throwing his weight behind Vanderweyden, and most of the Ventru, both newcomers and Prince Michaela's brood, have followed suit. The other remaining Harpy Maz also endorses the Malkavian, giving Carter both Harpies and significant powerhouses in kindred political society. Marlena, meanwhile, has a hold on those kindred who have much to gain and little to lose. As for Eugene, well, despite the distrust for the Tremere, a warlock can never be discounted, particularly since the clan holds so much power in the city and played such a major role in its liberation, but for the moment, it seems the Tremere region is third. A few hours before sunrise, making it Monday morning at 2.07 a.m., a small earthquake strikes the New York City metropolitan area for 94 seconds. No buildings crumble, and it's likely there are no deaths and maybe just a few wounded. Again, there is no major news coverage either in the night or during the day while vampires are asleep. Still, it's another drop in the bucket. Now the session will start on Monday, March 30th, 1998. So, uh, that earthquake just happened in the morning. The vampires, you know, fell asleep because of the daytime, and they'll just be waking up to, uh, encounter the situations together in whatever manner they deem fit. It will be interesting to see for sure, and if you followed along for all this time, now you see why I didn't want to open the session with this massive information dump of everything that transpired. It's all important, I think. You know, that's why I wrote it out. And uh, it just would have taken too long, uh, our session time. We only have so much time. So, there you go, folks. If you have any questions or comments, you can talk about it amongst yourselves in the YouTube comments. Uh... Of course, I'm not going to be much of a help with answering questions for all of you because I'm the storyteller and I'm keeping secrets. That's why I don't do a video recording of the sessions, why I do an audio only, and why Jordan ends up being the generous one who uh, records it live. Granted, you have to listen to his music, but what the hell. Speaking of which, currently it is exactly noon, and though this will get up a little bit later, our session's going to be starting in about three hours. And you can join uh, Jordan's Twitch channel and uh, participate in the chat. For that session, I personally don't pay it much attention, except for between the breaks when I answer whatever questions I can, and the players do as well. The players do participate in the chat more regularly. So there's that, folks. All right. Uh, see you later, either with this session or with some other endeavor. Toodaloo.